<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. For those who are in Central Zone and afternoon for those of us in Eastern, uh, welcome to the Harmful Algal Bloom webinar series. My name is Laura Essman, and I am from the Indiana Water Resources Research Center, which is located at Purdue University, and I will be your moderator today. This webinar is hosted by the Algal Bloom Action Team, of which the Indiana Water Resources Research Center is a member. The Algal Bloom Action Team is a collaboration of water professionals, researchers, and educators from the 12 states in the North Central region of the United States. And our team members include the National Network of Water Resources Research Institutes, the North Central Region Water Network, and University Extension within each state in the North Central region. <clears throat> In addition to hosting this webinar series, our team is also developing a website of resources that includes uh, fact sheets and frequently asked questions on HABS topics. And I encourage all of you to visit this site. And I'm going to try and put this into the chat so that you all have everyone. Sorry, I don't multitask very well. There you go. Um, Go ahead on and uh, head on into, over to our website at some point, and um, you can explore some of the resources that we've we have up to date, um, including a what you should know fact sheet, a HABs frequently asked questions database, and the recordings from the previous webinars and our virtual HABs research symposium, which was just held in January, and we are already planning on another one in January 2023. So keep your eyes peeled for that. <clears throat> Um, let's see, I'm supposed to be also advancing my slides here, which I'm forgetting. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we will have a Q&A session after our speakers present today, so after both are done. So as they speak, please list your questions um, in the Q&A panel, the chat box, and we will do our best to address all of them following the presentations. Um, we're not doing an upvote today, so you don't need to know about that. And today's presentations are being recorded, and they will also be posted at the Algo Bloom Action Team website, which is the link that I just put in the chat box uh, sometime after today's session. If you are having any technical issues today, or you have any questions about the Algo Bloom Action Team, please list those in the chat as well, and we will be happy to assist you as we go along. Today's presentations focus on how climate change is impacting marine and freshwater ecosystems and our current and historical HABs projects at the Illinois EPA. So our first speaker is Dr. Christopher Gobbler, an endowed chair and professor within the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University in New York. He received his master's and PhD from Stony Brook University in the 90s and began his academic career as a professor at Long Island University in 1999. In 2005, he joined Stony Brook University as the director of academic programs for the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences on the Stony Brook Southampton campus. And in 2015, he was named director of the New York State Center for, for Clean Water Technology. He's been editor-in-chief of the international peer-reviewed scientific journal, Harmful Algae, since 2018, and he has published more than 200 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals that explore the linkages between anthropogenic activities and coastal ecosystems. Um, I will wait on this, actually. Uh, Christopher's presentation today is entitled Harmful Algal Blooms, a Climate Change Co-Stressor in Marine and Freshwater Ecosystems, and he will kick us off today. I will stop sharing and let you take it away, Christopher. Okay, well, uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. And um, get my slides all set here. And uh, let's see. okay, so um, today I'm actually going to have a, um, I'm going to present on um, exactly as promised, but I actually have a, a bonus second presentation that's going to be maybe, uh, I think of maybe more hitting the spot here. Um, I'm, I, I study both marine and freshwater HABs, and so I'm going to, I'm going to cover this topic here of climate change. HABs is a climate change co-stressor, and then I'm going to just give a little taste of some research that 
uh, I do in freshwater systems, specifically targeting and thinking about um, microcystis blooms, which I figured for this crew may be uh, even greater interest. Uh, but on the climate change front, let's start there. So we all know we live in a changing world and uh, that climate change is here now. Um, we know the patterns in global temperatures. This is all through, I believe, 2019, but 2020 was another uh, record in 2021. Well, it's just off of the record. So we know what's happening with temperatures um, and we know how that's affecting oxygen in the world's oceans, but also in the Great Lakes, frankly, the patterns in the Great Lakes are the same. Uh, it's a simple law of physics. Warmer water holds less oxygen. Warmer water is more strongly stratified and therefore, as we warm, we're more likely to have uh, hypoxia occurring. Uh, and we know that the levels of CO2 in our atmosphere continue to rise. Um, this is now showing 2020, but right now uh, we're well above 420 when it comes to the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. That's acidifying our oceans, but again, the effects in the Great Lakes are expected to be just as great if not greater because of the lower, lower, lower buffering capacity of freshwater systems. So um, many marine people or oceanographers consider warming, deoxygenation and ocean acidification sort of the big three changes in the ocean. And again, as I just explained to you, this is happening uh, in freshwater systems in the Great Lakes as well. Uh, so the premise of this first half of my presentation is the fact that well, harmful algal blooms are sort of the fourth leg of the stool when it comes to climate change in my mind. Um, this is some data from a paper by Hans Perl, um, and essentially just showing that uh, one of many reasons that the hotter it gets, the more favored cyanobacterial blooms are. Uh, and in this iteration of showing that, it's just showing that the thermal optimum for cyanobacteria is just higher than in the phytoplankton. There's many other reasons that uh, Blooms like it hot, so to speak. Uh, but let's just say that the warmer it gets, we already went through it. The less oxygen there is, we're also having acidification. The, ocean, the freshwater systems are getting warmer and HABs are getting more intense. And so when we think about what's going on in coastal systems, um, we need to add harmful algal blooms to the mix uh, with regards to the stressors for marine organisms. So, you know, many times people are thinking about, okay, well, how does climate change affect the harmful algal blooms? Well, let's think about how the harmful algal blooms and the climate change collectively are affecting coastal ecosystems. So that's what I'm, uh, sort of the idea here of the coast stressor. And uh, I once put forth this image uh, at, a ta at a meeting just a few years ago and Noah loved it and they wanted me to put this in a paper. I didn't, but I do share it in talks. So another way of looking at this is the four horsemen of the aquatic climate change apocalypse. So we can put in warming, hypoxia, acidification, and harmful algal blooms. So again, the premise here is with all these things going on at once, how is that affecting aquatic life? Um, and so the paper that I showed you earlier on, and I should just again point out this paper, it's in a specialist group for harmful algae. Uh, it's an open access paper, as I make all of my research, so you can you can go ahead and, and get that paper for free, even though that journal is not for free. Uh, and so this is just sort of an image just showing how, uh, you know, all the climate change factors happening all at once, um, and add on top of that harmful algal blooms. And again, you can see this is maybe um, tilted towards the marine side because we have red for the harmful algae, but frankly, this could just as well be fresh water. Uh, and the, you know, in this paper, we talk about how whether you're an organism that lives in surface waters or in bottom waters, uh, you may be experiencing a different interaction of climate change stressors and harmful algal blooms. So in bottom waters, which are normally already low in oxygen and lower in pH, you may be more likely to experience harmful algal blooms with hypoxia and acidification. Whereas, uh, and whereas in surface waters, where obviously it's warmer, pelagic organisms may be more likely to experience warming and harmful algal blooms together. Now the question is, what do we know about all this? And the answer is very, very little. Um, this is a figure from the paper I just referenced. 
uh, essentially showing that there's been a grand total of 10 studies, at least as of 2020, seeking to understand the interactions of climate change stressors and harmful algal blooms on aquatic life. So what do we know about how, now that we know marine organisms are experiencing both harmful algal blooms and climate change at the same time, how is that gonna affect marine life? Well, you know, the bottom line is we don't know because there's just been, like I said, a total of 10 studies. And just to, you know, you can see, and I put above each bar here, um, the, the genera studied. And so, yeah, there's been a couple of studies on microcystis uh, and hypoxia, and I think one on thermal stress of microcystis and thermal stress on marine organisms, but otherwise not much. And now I am from Stony Brook University, and we do have this unfortunate pond on our campus that experiences freshwater HABs. And just to pull out some data, you know, uh, HABs can supersaturate water and lead to really high levels of dissolved oxygen, but they can also cause hypoxia and anoxia. And so this is just a data set from that pond from a few years back. Uh, and just essentially to just point out, you, the, here's an ecosystem where there are oxygen sags down to anoxia and microcystin is present. And again, how is that affecting aquatic life? We don't really know. Um, and then the final thing I'll talk about in this front is, is policy. You know, there's good policy for dissolved oxygen in this country, but a couple of years ago, my graduate student and I uh, wrote this policy paper in science um, about the current state of water quality protection policy for protecting aquatic life. Um, and you can see it's the fact that it's really not adequate for protecting fisheries. Um, and so it just really looked at the Clean Water Act and the fact that it's not really, the Clean Water Act is not um, considering pH, which is uh, certainly um, low pH is happening when we have low DO. It's definitely not considering harmful algal blooms. Um, and since it's only built around oxygen, it's going to be less protective than had been intended uh, by originally by the Clean Water Act, and therefore fisheries are going to be more at risk. So on that climate change front, again, I'm calling harmful algal blooms the fourth horseman of the ocean uh, or aquatic climate change apocalypse. Uh, we know some habs grow faster when there's more uh, CO2. Uh, we don't know anything about the effects, the co-effects of HABs and hypoxia, um, even though that HABs can cause hypoxia. Um, and here's the other, probably the most important point here. So again, we don't know anything about this, or very little, but as we move forward in time, even if harmful algal blooms don't get more intense, let's just take the position that they're going to stay the same. Okay? And there's been some argument in the literature about that. But well, let's take that position. Let's not conclude. Let's say it's an open question. Yep. But we know there aren't going away harmful algal blooms. And we also know that climate change will become more intense. And therefore, we can guarantee that in the future, the co-occurrence of climate change stressors and harmful algal blooms uh, will be more common and more uh, severe. OK, uh, I'm going to just quickly jump to a second topic that I thought would be also of broad interest. Um, for anybody out there listening. So, uh, and that has to do with microcystis blooms, which of course are something that everybody um, is very interested in in freshwater systems. They're in, um, and specifically thinking about nitrogen and microcystis blooms. Uh, we all know that microcystis is probably the most common uh, cyanobacterial harmful algal bloom on the planet. Um, this review paper. Uh, by my graduate student, Matt Harkey, um, and I and others published in 2016, essentially showed that you know, here's a global map of where you find microcystis um, and its toxins. And um, it's, it's everywhere. And if we had the same map for the United States, we'd see the same thing. Uh, and of course, microcystis is uh, of concern because it often makes the compound microcystin, uh, which is a gastrointestinal toxin that was first, um, first named its first name was fast death factor uh, in the literature when it was first discovered in the middle of the uh, 20th century. When it comes to these uh, harmful algal blooms and specifically uh, microcystis blooms, we know there are a lot of different environmental drivers, um, you know, anything from the biological like grazing and microbial interactions uh, to things like temperature and nutrient loading. Um, and again, you can think about uh, in freshwater systems, the, the most common nutrient of concern is usually phosphorus, 
but as I'm going to describe, you know, nitrogen can be important as well um, and for a few different reasons. Um, so again, this is a long standing debate in the literature. Um, if you just looked at the literature through, I would say just the 20th century, everyone would come to the consensus was, of course, it's just phosphorus and there's nothing else to consider. Of course, when it comes to microcystis as a non-diazotrophic cyanobacteria, it relies on exogenous sources of nitrogen to grow. Um, and there's some really interesting things that are coming out of the literature, some um, that have been published, and I think some things that are forthcoming that show the relationship between nitrogen fixation, uh, microcystis blooms, nitrogen limitation, and temperature trends. Um, and I'll just sum those up by saying some of those earliest conclusions about phosphorus being so important were really, a lot of those were based on very high latitude lakes that were very cold um, uh, way up in Northern Canada. And I will just say that probably not necessarily reflective of the way that a lot of lakes function. Um, and so I, just to point you to another paper that you can, uh, again, is something you can get uh, and consider a uh, collaborative paper written here about the role of nitrogen in controlling uh, cyanobacterial blooms. You see, I use the term dual role. Uh, and that's because not only is it affecting the growth, but if you look at the microcystin compound, each molecule of microcystin has 10 atoms of nitrogen. So this amounts to almost a nitrogen storage molecule. And uh, there's a long history now of, uh, in the literature, essentially showing if you give microcystis more, mic more nitrogen, it's gonna make more microcystin. So just that alone, that, that's, and that's the idea of the dual role. It's the fact that you, know, you can be ramping up the toxicity of microcystis um, by giving it more nitrogen. Uh, and then the other role of the dual part would be the growth effect. But just looking at some data here, uh, here's a, just looking at a study done by my former student, Jen, Jen Kowiak, uh, where we did work across Lake Erie. Um, you can see this paper again, you can get this online at uh, Limnology and Oceanography. Um, here's some experiments that were performed with water from the western basin of Lake Erie near the Maumee River, further out in the basin. Um, an experiment with many, many different treatments. We're looking at ambient and elevated temperatures, because I already referred to you the role that higher temperatures can play. We looked at nitrogen addition, phosphorus addition, and both compounds. Uh, and again, what I'd like to point out uh, in the blue bars, of course, of the cyanobacteria, in both cases in these experiments, compared to control conditions where nothing was added, every time we added nitrogen, we ended up with more cyanobacteria. Uh, and you can see sort of a synergistic effect with higher temperatures. So the temperature would ramp things up further. So an additive effect from temperature and nitrogen. Um, you know, but phosphorus looks just like the control. No, really no different. So it's, you know, it's really the nitrogen driving things here. And again, on the toxicity front, same experiments, but now we measure the amount of microcystin. Uh, and again, you see, well, phosphorus is not moving the needle whatsoever relative to control, but every time nitrogen was added, whether it was with or without phosphorus, uh, we got higher levels of microcystin. And again, in this case, a synergistically positive effect. Nitrogen clearly has a big effect on microcystis blooms. Um, and the, the final thing I want to talk about here is something I alluded to earlier, and that's what we call the microbiome of microcystis. Now, many people probably know microcystis in the field, and these are darker colored because they've been stained with Lubol's iodide. Uh, but if you look carefully, uh, this is you're looking at microcystis colonies and in the individual cells connected by their polysaccharide layer. But if you look carefully within that layer, what you see are that it's loaded with bacteria. Uh, and this we know to be the case. They, and there's a lot, been a lot of studies looking at this. So we've begun to look at this carefully uh, in different ecosystems in North America and just to answer some very simple questions. Um, what are the bacteria? How are they different from what you find in the lake? How might they influence these blooms? And how might they be influenced by what goes on in the lake? So we have an approach where why we're able to separate out the microcystis colonies uh, from the background community and also look at the entire community. So you're gonna see some graphs that look at the total community, what we call the free living community, less than 20 microns, and then the community within the microcystis colonies that have been separated out. 
we worked again in Lake Erie in the Western Basin, but also on a lake in New York called Lake Agawam. Some high throughput sequencing data. Again, if you're interested in the paper, the reference is down there. This is some frontiers of microbiology. Uh, and what you're looking at are the communities. Each color is a different type of bacteria. It's a time series from that location, Lake Agawam. Uh, we won't go through the details, but you should, should just be immediately clear to your eye that if you look at the total community and the free living community, it's different from what's in the microcystis colonies. So more of the proteobacteria in the colonies compared to the other groups, more of the acidobacteria, excuse me, the bacterioides uh, in the whole and free living community compared to the colonies. And then some groups in the colonies that you barely find in the other fractions. Um, and again, some groups that you find in the other fractions that are just about absent from the colonies. So right off the bat, these bacterial populations are not related to what's going on in the lake. And you know, statistically, uh, different if you do the statistical analyses. Uh, and in Lake Erie, again, a very similar story, some differences, but some similarities. Again, more of the proteobacteria uh, in the colonies, almost none of the uh, axinobacteria in the colonies, but whereas they're a big portion of the rest of the community, um, and a little bit more of the proteobacteria in the colonies relative to the other places. And again, groups you're finding in the lake, but not in the colony. So there's a selection for the groups being in and out. If you do some fancy statistical analyses here, um, a PCOA analysis specifically, and we look at the three fractions, colonies, particulate, and free living, we compare Lake Agawam and Lake Erie, what we see is a statistically different uh, clustering of the colonies compared to the other groups. And you can see the other groups clustering and intermixing, but not the colonies. And this goes down, you know, this is just looking at it in a, in a broad sense of community structure, uh, but you can do the same thing and pick out individual taxa as well. Uh, and in fact, even individual taxa that are involved in things like nitrogen fixation. So I missed that here, but uh, if you look at all the nitrogen fixing taxa, more in the colonies in Lake Agawam, uh, similar story for uh, Lake Erie. And when we look specifically at the commonality of the gene responsible for nitrogen fixation uh, over a, either a time series or in, in space across Lake Erie, uh, and we use different um, informatic approaches, what we see is more of these nitrogen fixation genes in the colonies than we do out in the lake itself. And that's both ecosystems in space and time. And you know, this is not the gene coming from microcystis, it's coming from other organisms. So bacteria. And just to show, we did some uh, follow-up experiments, again, looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, and temperature. Um, and what I want to show in this particular case uh, uh, is that in Lake Erie, we saw, again, the nitrogen effects, uh, the nitrogen treatment looking very different than the other treatments, um, or nitrogen with temperature being very different. But again, these things, in this case, these treatments moving the microbial community within the microcystis uh, colonies. Uh, and then finally, again, showing how the number of bacteria with that nitrogen fixation gene changing with response to the amount of nitrogen uh, and all these other genes turning on and off within that microbial community when we expose the colonies to uh, nitrogen. So I know I'm pretty tight on time, so I'll just, uh, a few parting words on just nitrogen and microcystis communities. Um, again, we've got a lot of data showing that uh, both the biomass of microcystis and the toxin levels can be controlled by nitrogen. The communities within those microcystis colonies are different than the rest of the communities. Um, there are a lot of gene pathways associated with nitro nitrogen acquisition, including those associated with nitrification, uh, and that, when you alter the water with regards to nitrogen, the bacterial community in the colonies is uh, changing. Okay, so I'm at the 20 minute mark. And so with that, I will end. Thank you kindly for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got some good questions coming in and we're gonna push those off until the QA session um, after our next speaker, which I'm going to share my screen again. All righty. 
So our second speaker today is Alexandria Turlip, and Alex works for the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency in the Bureau of Water, Surface Water Section, and is the Harmful Algal Bloom Program Coordinator. Alex joined, joined the agency back in October of 2020 and became the HAB Coordinator in June of 2021 when Terry Holland retired. And she stated that the Illinois EPA HAB program is still fairly young, but they are working hard to improve and expand it and are very excited for what the future holds. So Alex's presentation today is entitled Illinois Environmental Protection Agency's Harmful Algal Bloom Program. And this will be our final presentation today. Uh, please don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A panel and we will address them following the presentation. The floor is yours. Okay, great. I'm going to share my screen and um, Alex actually has present, uh, prepared a uh, recording of her presentation, though she is on the line to answer questions for us. Oh. All right. Let me know if y'all can't hear this. Let me try. everyone. My name is Alice Turlop. I work with the Illinois EPA in the Bureau of Water Surface Water Section, and I'm our HAB coordinator. I joined the agency in October of 2020 and work closely under Terry Holland, who retired in June of 2021. Today, I will be doing a presentation that gives an overview of our HAB program. Our program was not officially initiated until May of 2013 but there was a history of HABs and sample collection in the years leading up. It all began in 2005 with some taste and odor complaints at Otter Lake. Samples were collected and cylindrospermopsis was discovered with a cell count of around 300,000 cells per milliliter. At that time, the World Health Organization level of concern was 100,000 cells per milliliter. These results led to additional sampling. Less than a month later, with about a $10,000 budget, the first statewide monitoring effort was initiated and 22 sites across the state were sampled. In 2006, these efforts continued. The same number of sites were sampled and microcystin was once again detected, but not in high concentrations. 2007 through 2008 brought a new monitoring approach. Samples were collected at public access areas and hotspots within our ambient lake monitoring program. We did have some hits of microcystin, but nothing was above the high range, which at the time was 20 micrograms per liter. This was good news, but about 50% of those samples did have some microcystin detected. In 2009, there were no monitoring efforts. In 2010, Illinois had its first suspected case of a dog death, potentially due to algal toxins. Samples were collected for microcystin and a necropsy was performed. Microcystin levels came back low and the necropsy report showed that the likely cause of death was water intoxication, which had similar symptoms to algal toxin poisoning. In 2011, we began to utilize qualitative strip tests. This allowed for rapid preliminary results, which allowed us to take action if needed. 2012 was a drought year. Several lakes in Illinois experienced large bloom events with very high toxin concentrations. We're talking into the 10,000 micrograms per liter. USGS heard about the high toxin concentrations and contacted us to conduct a joint project. These sample results prompted several lake closures and showed that HABs were a definite health concern in Illinois. In January of 2013, a meeting was held with Illinois and other agencies to discuss HABs in Illinois. And in May of 2013, the Illinois EPA HAB program was officially initiated. The ultimate goal of our HAB program was and still is to protect public health and safety for drinking water and recreational uses. Our HAB program is designed as a monitoring program. Our three regional offices conduct two types of monitoring throughout the state routine and event response. The map on the right shows HAB monitoring locations within the past six years. The triangles show event response and the circles show routine monitoring locations. 
With routine monitoring, samples are collected on a schedule, regardless of if a bloom is present or not. These routine samples are collected at six locations, which I have listed below. Some of these include sites on the Fox River, beaches within our ALMP program, and public water supply intakes on streams. This monitoring occurs about once every four to six weeks in the summertime. Event response is the second part of our program. It tends to get the most attention from the public just due to the nature of bloom events. An event response is triggered by an observation of a bloom. This could be from a water body manager, a member of the public, or even Illinois EPA staff. These observations usually come to us through a report. There are a couple of ways to report a bloom to Illinois EPA, but the bloom report form at the top of this list is our preferred method. The bloom report form is available on our website, which I've linked here. It is a fillable PDF and it's also available as a printout. Here's an example of that bloom report form. We request specific information from the individual filling out this form. This includes water body name, county, because several lakes or water bodies might share the same name, GPS coordinates, and contact information. We also request that at least two photos be included with the bloom report form. And here's an example of some of the types of photos that we request. The photo on the left shows a large section of the bloom and the photo on the right shows a close-up. Both are useful in determining if there is potentially a cyanobacteria bloom. The second way to report a bloom is through direct contact with Illinois EPA staff. It's not uncommon for a water body manager to already have a working relationship with staff in their area, especially if their water body has had blooms in the past. Regional staff, will send the information along with any photos to headquarters, so all this information still comes to one place. Once we receive reports of a bloom, we review all information. If a bloom is suspected, we might send staff out to collect a toxin sample. Microcystin is collected at every site because it's the most common toxin and most likely to be found in high toxin concentrations. The other three toxins are collected on a per case basis. In addition to toxin samples, staff might also collect other parameters, including those listed, listed on the left-hand side of the slide. Regardless of parameters collected, we take photos at every event response site. After samples are collected, they're sent to our lab in Springfield, Illinois for quantitative analysis. The lab typically has final results within seven to 14 business days. Once we get the sample results, regional staff will reach out to the water body manager to let them know toxin concentration. In addition to sending samples to our lab, staff might also use qualitative strip tests for fast results. And these are really useful when you have to make a quick decision. Understanding the sample result is important. This chart shows the guidance level Illinois EPA currently uses to make recommendations. We use US EPA guidance for microcystin and cylindrospermopsin and World Health Organization values for anatoxin and saxitoxin. If these values are exceeded, we recommend that contact should be avoided. Once we provide the water body manager with sample results, it's their responsibility to notify their public. Signs are a great notification tool. They should have a clear, concise message and should be placed in areas where people are likely to access the water body. Social media and news releases can be useful when alerting a large number of people at one time. And the CDC has some excellent social media resources that I've linked at the end of this presentation. In homeowners associations, a meeting might also be a good way to communicate about a bloom. A question we often get asked is how long should I restrict access? 
We recommend waiting until all signs of the bloom have dissipated. If samples were collected, we recommend waiting until results indicate toxins are below guidance levels for two consecutive weeks. It's also important to remember that some toxins, like cylindrospermopsin, can remain even after the bloom has dissipated. So use your best judgment and when in doubt, keep out of the water. Occasionally a person or animal may experience symptoms of illness after contact with a suspected bloom. If this is the case, we direct the submitter to the Illinois Department of Public Health webpage to complete either the human or animal illness report forms that are linked on this slide. Illinois Department of Public Health also has some good information about HABs on their website. So some upcoming projects that we have going on include updating our website, creating a state response manual, and hosting some virtual workshops. We are working on updating our webpage and are in the process of improving that Bloom Report form shown earlier in the presentation to make that a little more user-friendly. The new form will still request the same information, but will be in a drop-down menu format, as you can see in the top picture. We hope to have this up on our webpage in the near future. We also plan to add a dashboard to our webpage within the next two years. Our hope is that the public will be able to use our dashboard to quickly access sample results. It will be an interactive map with clickable points, and we plan to design it after the Illinois EPA PFOS dashboard, shown in the lower left-hand corner. I've also included a link to that dashboard just in case anyone wants to check it out or explore it in more detail. We're working on developing a HAB response manual. It will provide detailed instructions on how to respond to a large scale event and who to contact should that bloom event ever occur. It will include program history, sampling and shipping procedures, and toxin thresholds, and will be modeled after the Ohio River Valley Sanitation Commission, also known as ORSENCO, and the Upper Mississippi River Basin Association, also known as UMBRA, plans. We are also hosting two virtual workshops in both 2022 and 2023 featuring Dr. Ann St. Amon. In these workshops, she'll go over bloom characteristics, toxins, and sample collection. Our 2022 events are scheduled for April 13th and April 22nd, and both those workshops are going to cover the same material and they're free, but we do require registration. So I've included the links to those registration forms just in case anyone is interested in attending either one of those workshops. That's about it for my presentation. Um, thanks for allowing us to be part of this webinar series and for allowing me to share our program. I've put some contact information up on the slide Again, my name is Alex. You can find my email address at the top of this list. And please feel free to contact me or reach out to me about any have related questions. I've also put information for Nicole Vidalis, our surface water section manager, and Hillary Marler, our data manager, just in case you want to reach out to them with specific questions. And I always like to include some have resources. So here are a few links if anyone is interested. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, lots of really good information today. I'm going to go back and share my screen. Um, Anne or Alex, uh, is there any way to put the links to those uh, virtual workshops in the chat today so that folks can register if they're interested? If so, that would be awesome. Should be able to add those. I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. Oh, I should be able to add those. Okay, super.
All right. I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's Algo Bloom Action Teams webinar series and a special thanks to our presenters, Dr. Christopher Gobbler and Alexandria Turlip for sharing their research and experiences with us. And I also want to, of course, um, thank the woman behind the scenes, Ann Nardi, um, for and the North Central Region Water Network for hosting the Zoom webinar and, of course, coordinating the technical aspects because we could not do this without her. As we move into the Q&A session, um, I'd like to remind you to check out the Algal Bloom Action Team website, which I dropped in the chat early on. And uh, here you'll be able to connect with the team and subscribe to our events. And right now, as I said, we are planning for another symposium in January, which seems like a long way off. So uh, for something nearer, we will be having another webinar, uh, webinar that is scheduled for Wednesday, June 1st at noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central. And we are still working on presenters for that, but please join us. Okay, um, I would like to go ahead and start Q&A and we'll draw from those, some of the initial questions, although I don't want to miss out on some for Alex, so I'll bounce back and forth a little bit. Um, following the Q&A session, I would ask you to complete the survey um, at a link that I will post in the chat box for you. So here we go. Uh, first one for Dr. Gobbler. With the effects of increased atmospheric temperatures and water temperatures in marine and Great Lakes environments, can we assume that the effects will be even greater in smaller shallow inland lakes? Um, yes. Uh, you know, again, if, if there's a specific threshold at which uh, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms are likely to occur. Um, you know, upper temperature threshold, let's say it's 15 degrees centigrade. Uh, the shallower the lake, the quicker it's going to get to that temperature and the more um, responsive it's going to be to atmospheric temperatures. So that would be, uh, I would say yes to that. Okay. I have one for both of you, but I'm going to ask Alex to address it first. Um, for an inland lake that is experiencing increased HABs, what actions do you suggest to try and reduce the frequency, duration, and intensity of the blooms? Um, I'm not 100% sure how to answer that question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Christopher, you want to take a take a whack at it? Yeah, I think. You know, I think there's there's a few answers there, and obviously this is really like a sixty four million dollar question uh, that every water body and watershed will be grappling with. Um, you know, I think you can think about it in two approaches. The, the one approach would be how do we make sure we make the come up with a permanent solution, and in some cases you might want to consider what is a quick action we can take to protect public health. And in some cases, this can be pretty serious. Um, on the longer term, in many, many or almost all cases, uh, you know, nutrient loads and reducing nutrient loading may be the, uh, the lever that's going to be most likely to have the uh, positive outcome uh, that you want in reducing these events. But uh, let me just say, it's in every single water body is going to be different. So I think you need to have the information on the watershed and the water body. You need to know the relative importance of the nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus or phosphorus and nitrogen, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and, um, and then you need to know what are the biggest sources of nitrogen and phosphorus to those systems, which would then allow you to come up with a management plan to start reducing those sources to reduce the intensity of the blooms. Uh, there are a bunch of other sort of quick fixes, some of which will be um, more and less effective depending on the watershed, uh, and all of which have, um, and more or less effective depending on the watershed as well as the, the type of uh, and intensity of the cyanobacterial bloom. Um, and they all have, uh, you know, potential that the efficacy will range and they may have side effects. So some people like to do things like locking out the phosphorus and sediments with things like phospholock that could work in the short term, not necessarily in the long term. Um, we've done a lot of work with hydrogen peroxide, which can be a short-term quick fix, but it's not uh, by any means, definitely not a long-term solution. It doesn't work well 
in highly eutrophied or very warm lakes. So, um, I mean, there's whole uh, seminars and, and, and hundreds of papers that come out on this every year. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, uh, you know, again, but you can turn to the literature to get more information. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Alex, we do have a question regarding the Bloomwatch app. Can the public still use the Bloomwatch app to report potential cyanohabs? Um, yes, we'll still take Bloomwatch submissions. Um, as long as at the very end, when you go to click submit, you do have to put the epa.hab at illinois.gov email address just to make sure that it also comes to us. All right. Uh, Christopher, how important is the presence of aquatic plants to the severity of HABs? Um, that's a good question. Again, as, I, uh, as a caveat from before, it'll be ecosystem specific. Um, in general, there, um, you, in some systems, there can be competition between aquatic plants and pelagic algae like cyanobacteria. And so the, the um, and, and so there have been cases, for example, where a water body is say uh, completely overgrown with different types of aquatic plants or have high levels. People don't like that, they take them out and then next they know they actually have a uh, cyanobacterial bloom as an unintended consequence. Um, you know, th these aquatic plants will compete for nutrients and therefore may make, there may make there be fewer nutrients available for uh, cyanobacterial blooms. So, um, uh, yeah, so there is, there is a, and there's possible there's, uh, compounds the plants release to inhibit the cyanohab. So it's, it's not a, a it's not a, an all out solution necessarily, but they, uh, that's the general relationship. And I should just mention, I'm going to put in the chat, um, on the idea, we have a link here to a, a report that uh, with the UN on uh, mitigating harmful cyanobacterial blooms. So you can, uh, it's a freely available report. And if anybody's interested, it expands on the answer I just gave uh, to the first question. All right, thank you. Um, Alex, do you know what strip test kits were or are used? And were they compared against lab tests for efficacy? Um, we use the Abraxas strip tests and, um, we do always send a sample to our lab. Um, those strip tests are only kind of used for fast decisions. And I think that they're usually pretty consistent with each other. Okay. Hopefully that answered the concerns listed in the Q and A. Also, I'm going to ask quickly, I checked were you able to post those links in the chat for the registration for the webinars? I think I did, but it might have only gone to one person. Okay, um, I will take a look and um, forward to everyone. So I just don't want people to think that I'm ignoring you. I will check <laughs> on it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Christopher, another question. I've, we've got somebody on here who's monitoring in northern Minnesota lakes that are nutrient low should they start monitoring for nitrogen? nitrogen. Um, they have been doing total phosphorus and chlorophyll A only for years. Uh, I think it's, it's worth looking at. You know, I think that, uh, um, I, and just to just clarify kind of a point that it, uh, out of my talk, and that is that I'm not, I would not presume to say that nitrogen is the only important thing, right? And we know I can, I'm sure, in fact, I know there are lakes for phosphorus, it's just gonna be all about phosphorus. Um, so it's going to be on a watershed by watershed basis. It's going to be based on the types of cyanobacterial present, uh, characteristics of the lake, characteristics of the watershed. Uh, but certainly, I think to get a more holistic view, uh, getting a handle on what's happening with nitrogen uh, is also of value. And um, you know, if you if if you end up finding that oh well, the nitrogen level levels of nitrate and ammonium. Um, are always uh, very, very high all throughout the year. Well, then there's nothing to worry about. But, you know, what's been discovered, for example, in Lake Erie is that most of the year, the nitrogen levels are very high. 
But when you get to late summer, they're drawn down to very low levels. And that happens to be exactly when these blooms happen. Um, and, you know, there's now been you know, probably a dozen papers showing how nitrogen is important in late summer uh, in Lake Erie. And so, uh, you know, more information can only help um, help anyone better understand how an event is, uh, how these events are controlled by uh, the relative importance of nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, I have another question that came in while you were addressing the phosphorus and nitrogen, um, and they wanted a clarification. Um, am I right that nitrogen has a much bigger effect than phosphorus, but that the two together actually reduce HABs? No, I mean, there might have been like a bar in, a, in an experiment, in one of the bars I bar grassing experiments that made it give that impression. But again, I just want to be, let me just be crystal clear. The relative importance of nitrogen and phosphorus is going to be lake and watershed dependent. And, um, and so, like I said, I can, I can very easily pull up uh, data to show systems that are very clearly phosphorus limited, very clearly nitrogen limited. Um, and, you know, you're, uh, uh, knowledge is, knowledge is power, data is power. And so, I, you know, you gotta, you have to know what, you know, what's happening in your individual lake. And if you're not measuring, you know, anything, any nitrogen, well, then you, you certainly uh, you may, you could be missing uh, something important. Okay. Alex, I think this one is for you. Maybe um, since you're developing that um, manual, and I just lost it. Here we go. During an algal bloom on our small lake a few years ago, one person wanted to take out a boat and run the motor through the bloom to break it up, in quotes. I did discourage him from doing this, but what could we have done? Um, we usually recommend just letting the bloom take its course. Um, because if you go out there with a boat and kind of kick it up, you risk, you know, exposure to toxins. Um, we don't usually recommend using any algicides just because then you run the risk of lysing the cells and releasing toxins all at once. So we usually just recommend that people wait it out and let it run its natural course. All right. Um, Christopher. Has there been any work investigating potential microbes that could function as probiotics for inhabiting for inhibiting HABs? Uh, actually, it's, so it's a good question, and uh, there definitely are algicidal bacteria uh, present, and that's been shown for both marine and freshwater HABs. Um, and, and it may well be that they that they're important for the collapse of some blooms. Um, you know, t there has not been a, you know, what of course we would all like would be that we've got a bacteria in a bottle that you can just add to a lake and get rid of the bloom. And, uh, well, that doesn't, you know, we, no one's gotten to that point. And if they had, we certainly would all know about it. We wouldn't have to talk about this any further. Um, but there are, again, they're called algicidal bacteria. So they've been identified and they, um, they've been shown to work. And I've, you know, I've even done research on that um, in in marine systems and the days there for freshwater systems, but they're, um, uh, it's no one's be able to bring it to the point of whole ecosystem application. Okay, I have a two part question for you. Um, why do you think there's a bacteria species difference in the colony versus open water? And is there anything specific that the colony might be providing to certain bacteria? Or is it temperature related, water current related, or what? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's an old uh, axiom in, in microbial ecology that is stated is uh, everything is everywhere and the environment selects. And so, um, and so even the bacteria that we barely can find in the colonies, they're probably out in the water and vice versa. So if you ascribe to that whole concept, the point is that within the colony is an environment that's perfect for certain bacteria, right? The bacteria firstly aren't gonna move around a lot. Uh, they're getting a source of carbon from the uh, microcystis that whole mucilage around the colonies is a good carbon source. Bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria need carbon more than anything else. And so they're getting a steady source of carbon. Um, and they're also protected maybe, right? If you're, if you're a bacteria out in the open waters could be eaten by some small, um, zooplankton uh, 
nan heterotrophic nanoplankton. Um, whereas within the colony, they actually might have uh, protection as well. Um, and, and we can also, you know, it's, it's not, it's been shown even, I was going to say hypothesized, but it's even been shown that the, then the bacteria themselves may be supplying the microcystis colonies with things like vitamins or other cofactors that um, you know, accelerate their growth. So it's, uh, you know, we, we consider it as a symbiotic relationship and, and the bacterial assemblage is different because the environment in the colony uh, is different than the open wall. Okay, I'm going to open this question up to both of you. Um, for an inland lake that's experiencing increasing HABs, what actions do you suggest to try to reduce the frequency, duration, and intensity of the blooms? Alex, you want to, I'm going to... Um, again, I'm not really 100% sure how to answer that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's fine. Yeah, I just I, um, similar to the question from before, and so again, I think the uh, the, an the the best answer is get as much information as possible, right? So you need to know what's driving those blooms. Is it nitrogen? Is it phosphorus? And then even once you get to that answer, you need to know what are the biggest sources and most important sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, and then a long term plan for reducing those sources, um, and then in parallel. You, one might consider again the short-term fixes, um, such as sediment control um, or, or other in-water applications that might give temporary relief while the longer-term um, uh, action plan is implemented. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time today. There are still several unanswered questions. Um, listed here that are really good. Uh, maybe there's a way for us to talk to both of you and provide some answers. Um, I'll have to talk to Ann Nardi about that. But I very much appreciate everyone joining us today and our two presenters. Please note that um, I think Ann or somebody did put the links to the virtual HABS training that Alex mentioned in the chat box. So if you're interested, please register. And please take a few moments to complete the survey, uh, the post webinar survey, so we can get your comments and feedback on this series. Um, again, this will be recorded and within a couple of days, we'll post it at our, um, at our website, which is also in the chat box. So thank you, Christopher and Alex for joining us and everyone else and have a great rest of your day. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.